Hi, my name is Rolf Arsuz, the owner here at Block Operations, and I'm going to talk about Bitcoin mining at scale. I've been doing this for a while, and both mining uh, small locations as well as larger ones. And there's some reasons why if you get into this and want to look at making money, you need to look at going to a larger location. We'll go through some of the revenue and expenses that uh, talk through that and um, we'll talk about the different economics of it, uh, the different uh, characteristics of the things that you can mine. Happy to take questions um, and uh, let's get started. So one of the big things that everybody focuses on is revenue. And yeah, you can bring in revenue. You go ahead and uh, buy a Bitcoin miner, like an Antminer S9 from Bitmain, and you can plug it in and get going and, and earn Bitcoins right away. You can get build your uh, six rig GPU miner, do the same thing. That's great, but what you need to do is manage expenses. To manage expenses is a little bit tougher. And we're gonna go through the different coins that we can mine and the type of equipment that you need for them. And we're gonna talk about the different types of expenses that you're gonna have as well. Okay, so these are the five main things that we're gonna look at mining. And they all have different uh, progressions on the technology cycle. When a coin first comes out, the, if it's a new type of technology, it's first mined with CPUs, a central processing unit of a regular computer. After that, it fairly quickly moves to uh, GPU-based mining. GPUs, graphical processing units, the graphic cards have between two to 3,000 processors on them, and applications can be set up to mine in parallel on those. So GPU mining is the next step. If, the, if people determine that the coin is going to be around long enough, typically they'll start designing application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs. And there's a process technology discussions with GPUs and ASICs that we'll have as well. There's typically an intermediate step in there where people do field programmable gate arrays, basically a programmable ASIC. Uh, better than a GPU for some cases, and, uh, but not quite as good as an, as an ASIC. And so depending on where things are on the technology cycle for mining depends on what type of equipment that you need to, to buy. And so let's talk a little bit about semiconductor process technology. Okay, so if you're going to be looking at mining things, and you're going to be buying equipment, make sure you look at what the semiconductor process technology that it's based on. Reason is, semiconductors follow Moore's law, which is held fairly steady, and his original iteration of the law was something like every 18 months, the amount of processing power that you can get for the same price doubles. And that's held true since the mid-60s. Now, the latest process technology is 14 nanometer. Intel's got a bunch of big fabs, and I think some of the uh, like TSMC and uh, SMC have those as well. But to give you an example, um, the amount of power that's used for the same type of calculation depends on the square of the process technology. This summer, or last summer of uh, 2016, we went through a generational change on uh, ASIC miners for Bitcoin. So if we use Bit, uh, Bitmain as an example, Bitmain's Antminer S7 was based on 28 nanometer process technology. Now the S9 came out, uh, the R4 and the T9 are also based on the same chip, and they're based on 16 nanometer process technology. State of the art is 14. There's some GPUs uh, that NVIDIA and AMD have that's based on 14. But if you look at the square of 14 times 14 is 196, 28 times 28 is 784, 70 to 4 divided by 196, that's 4 to 1. So you get four times as much efficiency using the latest process technology. And this is why when new chips come out, and a chip takes maybe you know, two, two to three years to develop, then in order to be mining and making money, you've got to switch over to using the latest process technology. So the good news is, 
there's always entry points into, the, into Bitcoin mining. Because when the process technology changes, everybody needs to switch out their equipment as rapidly as they can. Now, what happens when more people add miners to the system, there's not more revenue that comes up. Based on the technology of the coin, and we can use Bitcoin for an example, uh, every 10 minutes, uh, there's a reward that comes out, and that's 12 and a half Bitcoins. There's also transaction fees uh, that add up. Transaction fees. I don't know what those are at right now. Let's say that they're one Bitcoin. It's assumed that as Bitcoin progresses over the years and the mining reward goes away, that there'll be enough increased usage that the transaction fees will cover everything. But that's why sometimes Bitcoin miners plan in four-year cycles, because this happening happens about every four years. And if you can build up your equipment and run it and be profitable during the, those four years, that's great. But you also need to make look at upgrading your equipment when there's a generational change in the semiconductor process technology. So that's on the revenue side of things for what you can bring in. Now, there's a total amount of um, mining capacity that's out there. And there's only a fixed reward. So as the mining capacity increases, the amount of reward that people get when they join mining pools goes down. So over time, what I expect to happen um, is that the mining capacity goes up, the reward goes down, reward per machine, um, but also in there, the price of the coin goes up. So depending on what the demand for the coin is, and depending on how fast uh, capacity comes online, there's a balance of profitability in there. Now, so far, over the years, uh, the profitability has been positive. Although, about a year and a half ago, when the Bitcoin price was ab around 300 and there was a lot of capacity, some people were mining at a loss, um, depending on what their costs were. So that's a good time to segue into, okay, this is the revenue that we bring in by running our machines and joining into a mining pool and getting coins and then you can sell coins periodically. So you don't have to sell them as soon as you get them. You also need to, on the revenue side, you need to have savings. Because you need to save money both in Bitcoin and in, in dollars in case the Bitcoin price goes down dollars or whatever your local currency is. Um, so that when the next generation of equipment comes out and you need to look at changing over it, uh, that you have the money to do that. Okay, so let's talk about expenses. Um, we can break those up into the standard types of things of uh, fixed expenses and variable expenses. But as you bring in revenue from running your mining equipment, you need to look at paying your bills. Okay? And what are your major bills? Okay, so your major expenses, both fixed and variable expenses, the big one is going to be power, because these machines use a lot of power. So the better you can minimize that, and we'll talk through the specifics of electric power, the better off you're going to be. In fact, in some places, if you have very inexpensive electricity, some of the other things don't matter. And if you have expensive electricity, you're better off not mining at all. Payroll, you got to minimize the amount of people that you have. When I I started um, my IT business back in 2002, and the biggest cost that we had through the entire existence until we sold that business uh, about a year and a half ago was payroll. It costs a lot to have people on staff. Anything that you can do to reduce your payroll costs will come out into the bottom line. Rent. Um, I've been to some beautiful data centers, putting in servers, putting in networks, all sorts of things like that. You don't want to be in a beautiful data center. You want to be in low-class industrial space that's inexpensive. It doesn't need to be pretty. You don't need a lot of internet. It's good to have pretty fast internet. Uh, the um, 
the GPU miners and the, the Bitcoin miners download chunks of information to process, but compared to a lot of other internet providers or internet applications, it's not a lot that's required, but it has to be there. Uh, and then, of course, you need insurance and all the other basics of, of doing business. So let's talk a little bit more about electricity and how to, how to look at that and see if it's even okay to start mining in your area. Okay, so all these things are, are powered by electricity. Now all the devices themselves are typically powered by 12 volts DC. So you'll have um, AC power coming in, you'll have power supplies that convert it to DC, then you'll plug the DC into the equipment, whether it's a computer or uh, an ASIC miner or whatever. So you got to look at, to see if you can get good, cheap electricity. Uh, the rule of thumb is you need to have less than 10 cents per kilowatt hour to even think about mining uh, profitably. In a lot of cases, there's also a demand fee. So you got to check your electric utilities in the areas that you think you're mining and figure out what the different pricing is based on uh, the, the usage and the kilowatt hours that you're going to use as well as the demand. Now, kilowatt hours is the actual amount of watts that you use over a period of time. Demand is a little trickier. Demand is variability in usage. So say you're an industrial plant where sometimes you need to have 500 kilowatts coming in, but most of the time you're using about 50. Well, you're going to have a huge demand variance because the electric company needs to bring in all the wires to handle 500 kilowatts, even though you're only mostly using 50 watts, or 50, anyway. You're only using a portion of that. So there's typically some type of pricing that affects demand. And by adding these, this pricing together, you get what's typically known as an effective kilowatt hour rate. Uh, now the good thing about mining is you run the stuff 24-7, so you're going to have very little demand surcharge. So in some cases, you can ignore demand if it's set up that it's only a surcharge based on variability of electricity that you use. In other cases, there's always a demand fee. So you need to put together a spreadsheet and figure out what your effective kilowatt hour rate is going to be at different levels of electric usage. And the amount of electricity that we use is measured in kilowatt hours. And there's a demand charge, but we don't have to worry about the demand charge unless it's fixed. So we're going to be talking volts. And normally, the electric company likes to bring, get the electric voltage as high as it can because it reduces the amount of amps that have to come across the wire. So when you're talking electricity, you're talking volts, amps, and watts. Now watts is usually pretty easy because it's voltage times the amps. Um, and this is AC electricity that we're talking about. Now, volts for the mining that you're going to want to do, you're going to want to use greater than 200 volt AC. So, if you're, uh, in, in some cases, you're going to be able to use 208 volt AC or 240, um, but you don't want to be down in the 110 range because it's very inefficient. Uh, amps determines the thickness of the wire because it's the uh, amount of electricity going through. So, if you can for the same wattage, double the voltage, you have half the amount of amps that go through. Anyway, uh, and then as you get into electricity, most of the electricity in your house is single phase AC, but electricity is brought to locations using three phase. And if you're going to be running uh, fans uh, and other types of rotating machinery, you want to keep it as three phase equipment because it's much more efficient. A simple analogy I use is, Single phase electricity is like pedaling a bicycle with one pedal. Three phase electricity is like pedaling a bicycle with three pedals and three legs, uh, if you can imagine that. But anyway, three phase el electricity is a lot more efficient. We've got to split it into single phase before we be deliver it to the power supplies, and the power supplies turn it into DC power. So we'll go through what a typical electrical uh, build out would look like for an installation in a minute. But let's talk about real life examples uh, at this uh, time. So we've had Bitcoin go up in price quite a bit over the last few months, and that's very exciting because the folks that have 
uh, Bitcoin miners in place and other things like that in place, all of a sudden are looking pretty profitable. Whereas maybe six months or a year ago, it was kind of on the edge of profitability. Remember these, uh, these times of profitability aren't permanent because as there's a lot of profit, there are a lot more miners jump into the business uh, and it increases the overall hashing rate and reduces the amount of Bitcoin that's split up between everybody. But let's take an example uh, from one of the mines that I consult with and we'll talk through what some of the, the pricing is. Now this is uh, January of 2017, late January, uh, and things change all the time. But for example, uh, for a, say you wanted to do uh, a mine that had 200 of the Antminer S9s. Uh, for those of y'all that's not that aren't familiar with the Antminer S9, uh, they'll they're about uh, we'll just say on average 12 terahash per second, and they use on average about 1,500 watts of electricity. Um, so 200 of those would be quite a bit. So 200 times uh, 12 terahashes. Um, anyway, per on a monthly basis, what those would that would earn right now is about 50 bitcoins and in dollars that's about $46,000 okay so what are the costs that we're looking at here in order to earn that Bitcoin well we're not even going to talk about the capital cost of acquiring those ant miners as well as all the network gear uh, the entire uh, electrical infrastructure that can power those miners uh, and the power supplies and things like that. Let's just focus on what the what the monthly profitability is. Um, and if your electric cost is on the order of about, oh, um, we'll say 0 0.09 uh, cents dollars per kilowatt hour, um, yeah. Uh, that electricity is, usage is going to be about 216,000 kilowatt hours per month. And the price, we'll just say that's around uh, $17,000. So that should give you a net of about $28,000 that you can use to pay off the loan that you made, to buy those things, to save money, uh, to pay payroll and things like that. Now, 200 Bitcoin miners, that's a, a pretty big installation. You're looking at, um, well, you're looking at a pretty big installation because there's power and there's cooling and there's network and stuff like that. Um, and we can go through and, and add up what those look like. Um, but here's an idea of, of what the, the profitability is. So you need to, out of that $28,000, you're like, well, I can do a lot with that $28,000. Well, you got to pay rent, you know, three to four to five thousand dollars. Uh, you got to pay payroll. Payroll adds up quick. If you're paying someone, let's say sixty thousand a year, that's that's five to eight thousand dollars a month in burden costs. You want to have minimal payroll uh, at all. Insurance is going to cost you, I don't know, three, four, five thousand dollars a year. And again, this is pretty risky because the Bitcoin price might go up. You might not be able to buy equipment and things like that. Let's talk about what that equipment price is. If you can get it in a wholesale type. Uh, environment, these things will probably cost you around uh, $1,300 each. Add a, a power supply, a PDUs, switching, other things like that. We'll say on a per uh, amp miner cost with all the other stuff, it's about uh, $1,600. Now, this does not include the whole electric build out uh, for this type of facility. The electric build out for that facility is going to be on the order. Of, we'll just say about $150,000. You could look for uh, lower prices and doing all sorts of things like that. But that's, uh, that's quite a bit. Um, so 200 times 1,600, what do we have? 32 and then how many zeros? Uh, one, two, three, four. $320,000 of equipment. Okay, so in order to produce that net of 28,000 before all the other things, we're looking at uh, $320,000 worth of equipment and $150,000 worth of build-out. Okay, so that's about $500,000 worth of costs. How many months is it going to take us to pay back $500,000 worth of costs uh, at this rate? 
it's going to take a while. That's why you got to keep your costs low and you got to use your equipment for a while. Now there is some good news in here. Bitcoin price might keep going up, but like we said, as the price goes up, more people will get into it. Uh, anyway, if you don't have payroll costs and you don't have much in the other way of costs, you can be paying back uh, the equipment that you purchased in, in a year to a year and a half. And if you're mining with it for two to three years, that's a pretty good deal right there. If you already have an existing infrastructure that you've built out that you can continue to years, year, year after year because the electricity is not going to change much, that's going to help you also. So these types of numbers of the build out and other things like that are why larger existing Bitcoin mining facilities have an advantage. They already have the electric infrastructure, the network infrastructure, the uh, cooling system in place. Uh, they probably even have all the uh, AC to DC power supplies to power the miners. They just have to switch equipment in and out. The other thing is, once you mine at scale, you can start getting better electricity pricing. Now, in a lot of cases, if you look at your electricity pricing, there's going to be a break uh, at about the 200 uh, kilowatt hour per month rate. So, look at here. We used about 216,000 kilowatt hours. Well, in a lot of cases, if you're using more than 200,000 kilowatt hours, anything above 200,000 kilowatt hours is going to be a lot less expensive. So, for example, our utility here locally, if it's um, less than 200,000 kilowatt hours, they're charging about nine cents per kilowatt hour. 0.09. But anything above that is about 0.035. So it's a lot less. So take this same thing and double it up to 400 amp miners, or 800, or 1600, and you can start to see how a larger facility will see. Um, we'll see that you're able to uh, scale different things. You're able to scale your people, you're able to have lower electricity prices, and you're able to have everything in one place. So anyway, those are the big picture numbers. So if you're looking to do this type of thing, and you have investors that you're working with, and you can start looking at, okay, I've got half a million dollars, uh, or a million dollars that investors are, are willing to work with me to put in to build a larger facility like this, then you can get to these levels where the electric price is lower. And once you get in and you have a facility, um, and then you have all the electric infrastructure in place to do this type of thing, then the succeeding years of uh, replacing the equipment ends up costing you less and you end up being more profitable. Uh, there's also uh, different types of automation that you can do. Um, there's, there, there's a lot of other things that you can do to improve your profitability. So let's talk about what the actual uh, insides would look like of this facility. Okay, so power plant makes electricity. We're not going to discuss solar. We can discuss why that's a bad idea some other time. Just if you're near a hydro power plant, a dam, you're usually going to have good pricing. Um, and you'll have nice steady power. Bring, just come in to close to your facility outside uh, in a three-phase transformer. Um, this example is for um, about 200 miners, which I was using in the previous example. So this would probably have to be around a 200 kVA transformer. Uh, kVA is kind of like kilowatts. It's just a little different. Um, VA is volt times amps. Um, so KVA takes into account the power factor. Rotating machinery tends to have power factor that um, the impedance makes the electric use inefficient. So that's why the transformers tend to be measured in, in KVAs. Um, but the equipment we use has a, a pretty uh, decent power factor, so we can directly translate to amps pretty much. Especially if we're going from three-phase electricity to single phase where you pick up some efficiencies uh, because there's a conversion from three phase to single phase as well. Anyway, you bring it into your building and you got maybe a 1200 amp switch gear. We're talking about 208 volt AC here. And one example is you can break it out into three 400 amp panels. I like to use common inexpensive equipment. Again, it's all part of keeping the costs low. So from these 400 amp panels, you can break these out into 16 30 amp panels. Is that about right? Anyway, Whenever an electrician talks about a panel or a breaker, 
automatically think 80% of that. Because if they say it's a 30 amp receptacle, that means 24 amps steady state load. And we're doing things at steady state load. If you try to run 30 amps through a 30 amp receptacle 24 hours a day, it'll probably overheat and pop. In the least case, it'll be less efficient just because the electrical wiring warms up. Um, so coming out of here, we can do uh, 16 uh, 30 amp connectors. I like to use just common L6 30R receptacles, and that way you can get nice, inexpensive uh, PDUs, uh, power distribution units. Those are fancy names for big power strips. Um, for example, I like to use uh, Triplite, the PDU, oh, is it uh, H30V, something like that. Um, it's got 10 little connectors on it, and it has a, a, so a socket that goes into this receptacle, and if you have a rack of them, you can just rack them up. So uh, 16 uh, PDUs coming out of here. The best thing to do is about use 5,000 watts. You might be able to, again, get up to 6,000 watts if you're doing um, the full 30 amps and 208 volts. It's easier if you're using 240 volts, but when it's coming in at three phase, 208 is better. So each power distribution unit, if we're talking amp minor S9s, those are each 1,500 watts. So 1,500, another 1,500 brings us to 3,000. This is 4,500. Ideally, you should be powering three amp miners off this one PDU that comes off this 30 amp uh, 200 volt circuit. So let's talk about what that might look like uh, from a equipment standpoint. So here in a typical uh, environment, we've got um, a very dense, um, we've got a very dense Antminer S9 deployment. So this is 24 uh, in a single rack, and they're not all that big, so you can, you can fit these together nicely. So these are the uh, Antminer S9s. These are the AC to DC power supplies. And you're going to need, like I said, eight power distribution units. Um, and, and those PDUs are each going to plug into each one of those 30 amp uh, connectors. So we got eight 30 amp connectors coming into eight PDUs, and from the PDUs, we power three amp miners per PDU. Um, so you can see it all kinds of adds up there. We've got four shelves of them, we've got four sets of PDUs. Now, each one of these devices needs to be connect, connected to a network switch. So we'll connect uh, 24 ports. I like to use 48 port switches. And since I got a lot of Cisco networking experience, I buy used switches. I, I get the used Cisco 3750 48 port switches. I can get those for probably about 50 bucks each on eBay. Every once in a while, one of them doesn't work. But those things are reliable as heck. And even though they're only 100 megabit per second, they work fine for me. So I uh, usually will put the switch up there too. And this is about 24 amp miners. And if you want 200, you put eight of these racks, and then you just got to cool them. So let's talk about how we want to cool them. Now, blowing air through them is about the best way to do it. So each one of these amp miner S9s uses about 220 cubic feet per minute. So if we're going to do um, 200 of them, and we need to do uh, 220 cubic feet per minute to exhaust all the air that these guys bring out. What's that? 2 times 2 is 4. And again, that's zeros. Uh, 220, 200. Um, 44,000 cubic feet per minute. Does that sound about right? Uh, anyway, I think that's about right. So that's a lot of air. So a typical exhaust fan, like a 48-inch exhaust fan, is going to be about 20,000 cubic feet per minute. So in order to cool all this stuff, you got to have some big exhaust fans, and then you got to have some big filtered intake fans. If you don't filter your intake fans, then you're going to get dust in all these things, and you're going to have to open them up and blow them out. Anyways, there's a lot that goes into this type of things, but Bitcoin mining at scale is definitely something that you can do. And 
You just got to be willing to invest. You got to understand how to operate things uh, at, a, at a more advanced level. Now you can you can work with contractors who will do this stuff. Uh, HVAC guys will come in and design and put in a, a, a cooling system for natural circulation cooling. These things run pretty warm. They're not like servers. They don't have spinning disk hard drives in them that overheat. Um, the electricity, work with the electricians. Remember, anytime an electrician gives you a number, take 80% of it. Network, um, yeah, you'll probably need to work with a network and computer guy. And if you really want to do things uh, right, instead of just mining Bitcoin, you mine Bitcoin, you mine Litecoin, you mine Zcash, you mine Ethereum, and all sorts of other things. That way you're kind of spreading it out um, and hedging your bets and not having everything uh, built on top of Bitcoin. Anyway, that's just an introduction. If y'all have questions based on any of this type of stuff, I'm happy to answer questions. I'll probably be doing more um, video overviews and uh, showing you some of this stuff uh, in production. Thanks.